Chapter 70 The Least of These My Brethren This chapter is based on Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. Thus Christ on the Mount of Olives pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment day, and he represented its decision as turning upon one point. When the nations are gathered before him, there will be but two classes, and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or have neglected to do for him in the person of the poor and the suffering. In that day, Christ does not present before men the great work he has done for them in giving his life for their redemption. He presents the faithful work they have done for him. To those whom he sets upon his right hand, he will say, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in naked and you clothed me i was sick and you visited me i was in prison and you came unto me but those whom christ commends know not that they have been ministering unto him to their perplexed inquiries he answers inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren you have done it unto me jesus had told his disciples that they were to be hated of all men to be persecuted and afflicted. Many would be driven from their homes and brought to poverty. Many would be in distress through disease and privation. Many would be cast into prison. To all who forsook friends or home for his sake, he had promised in this life a hundredfold. Now he assured a special blessing to all who should minister to their brethren. In all who suffer for my name, said Jesus, you are to recognize me. As you would minister to me, so you are to minister to them. This is the evidence that you are my disciples. All who have been born into the heavenly family are in a special sense the brethren of our Lord. The love of Christ binds together the members of his family, and wherever that love is made manifest, there the divine relationship is revealed. Every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Those whom Christ commends in the judgment may have known little of theology, but they have cherished his principles. Through the influence of the divine spirit, they have been a blessing to those about them. Even among the heathen are those who have cherished the spirit of kindness. Before the words of life had fallen upon their ears, they have befriended the missionaries even ministering to them at the peril of their own lives. Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly, those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and have done the things that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of God. How surprised and gladdened will be the lowly among the nations and among the heathen to hear from the lips of the Savior, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. How glad will be the heart of infinite love as his followers look up with surprise and joy at his words of approval. But not to any class is Christ's love restricted. He identifies himself with every child of humanity. That we might become members of the heavenly family, he became a member of the earthly family. He is the son of man and thus a brother to every son and daughter of Adam. His followers are not to feel themselves detached from the perishing world around them. They are a part of the great web of humanity and heaven looks upon them as brothers to sinners as well as to saints. The fallen, the erring, and the sinful 
Christ's love embraces. And every deed of kindness done to uplift a fallen soul, every act of mercy is accepted as done to him. The angels of heaven are sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. We know not now who they are. It is not yet made manifest who shall overcome and share the inheritance of the saints in light. But angels of heaven are passing throughout the length and breadth of the earth, seeking to comfort the sorrowing, to protect the imperiled, to win the hearts of men to Christ. Not one is neglected or passed by. God is no respecter of persons, and he has an equal care for all the souls he has created. As you open your door to Christ's needy and suffering ones, you are welcoming unseen angels. You invite the companionship of heavenly beings. They bring a sacred atmosphere of joy and peace. They come with praises upon their lips, and an answering strain is heard in heaven. Every deed of mercy makes music there. The Father from his throne numbers the unselfish workers among his most precious treasures. Those on the left hand of Christ, those who had neglected him in the person of the poor and the suffering, were unconscious of their guilt. Satan had blinded them. They had not perceived what they owed to their brethren. They had been self-absorbed and cared not for others' needs. To the rich, God has given wealth that they may relieve and comfort his suffering children. But too often they are indifferent to the wants of others. They feel themselves superior to their poor brethren. They do not put themselves in the poor man's place. They do not understand the temptations and struggles of the poor, and mercy dies out of their hearts. In costly dwellings and splendid churches, the rich shut themselves away from the poor. The means that God has given to bless the needy is spent in pampering pride and selfishness. The poor are robbed daily of the education they should have concerning the tender mercies of God, for he has made ample provision that they should be comforted with the necessities of life. They are compelled to feel the poverty that narrows life and are often tempted to become envious, jealous, and full of evil surmisings. Those who themselves have not endured the pressure of want too often treat the poor in a contemptuous way and make them feel that they are looked upon as paupers. But Christ beholds it all, and he says, It was I who was hungry and thirsty. It was I who was a stranger. It was I who was sick. It was I who was in prison. While you were feasting at your bountifully spread table, I was famishing in the hovel or the empty street. While you were at ease in your luxurious home, I had not where to lay my head. While you crowded your wardrobe with rich apparel, I was destitute. While you pursued your pleasures, I languished in prison. When you doled out the pittance of bread to the starving poor, when you gave those flimsy garments to shield them from the biting frost, did you remember that you were giving to the Lord of glory? All the days of your life I was near you in the person of these afflicted ones, but you did not seek me. You would not enter into fellowship with me. I know you not. Many feel that it would be a great privilege to visit the scenes of Christ's life on earth, to walk where he trod, to look upon the lake beside which he loved to teach, and the hills and valleys on which his eyes so often rested. But we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, or to Bethany in order to walk in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his footprints beside the sick bed, in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys of the great city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. All may find something to do. The poor always you have with you, Jesus said, and none need feel that there is no place where they can labor for him. Millions upon millions of human souls ready to perish, bound in chains of ignorance and sin have never so much as heard of Christ's love for them. 
were our condition and theirs to be reversed, what would we desire them to do for us? All this, so far as lies in our power, we are under the most solemn obligation to do for them. Christ's rule of life, by which every one of us must stand or fall in the judgment, is, Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. The Savior has given his precious life in order to establish a church capable of caring for sorrowful, tempted souls. A company of believers may be poor, uneducated, and unknown, yet in Christ they may do a work in the home, the neighborhood, the church, and even in the regions beyond, whose results shall be as far-reaching as eternity. It is because this work is neglected that so many young disciples never advance beyond the mere alphabet of Christian experience. The light which was glowing in their own hearts when Jesus spoke to them, Thy sins be forgiven thee, they might have kept alive by helping those in need. The restless energy that is so often a source of danger to the young might be directed into channels through which it would flow out in streams of blessing. Self would be forgotten in earnest work to do others good. Those who minister to others will be ministered unto by the chief shepherd. They themselves will drink of the living water and will be satisfied. They will not be longing for exciting amusements or for some change in their lives. The great topic of interest will be how to save the souls that are ready to perish. Social intercourse will be profitable. The love of the Redeemer will draw hearts together in unity. When we realize that we are workers together with God, His promises will not be spoken with indifference. They will burn in our hearts and kindle upon our lips. To Moses, when called to minister to an ignorant, undisciplined, and rebellious people, God gave the promise, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee. This promise is to all who labor in Christ's stead for his afflicted and suffering ones. Love to man is the earthward manifestation of the love of God. It was to implant this love, to make us children of one family, that the King of glory became one with us. And when his parting words are fulfilled, love one another as I have loved you, when we love the world as he has loved it, then for us his mission is accomplished. We are fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. But if thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? In the great judgment day, those who have not worked for Christ, who have drifted along thinking of themselves, caring for themselves, will be placed by the judge of the whole earth with those who did evil. They receive the same condemnation. To every soul a trust is given. Of every one the chief shepherd will demand, Where is the flock? that was given thee, thy beautiful flock. And what wilt thou say when he shall punish thee 